Father, we come to the throne of grace in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, Lord, knowing that you are always uh, willing to listen to us and answer our requests and prayers. Lord, this moment we bring Elizabeth to, to, to the throne of grace. Lord, I pray that your healing hand may be upon her and she may be able to recover soon and may bless your name, Lord, especially strengthen her in her work. Provide her your grace uh, as she's working at home and even serving the people here uh, with medical assistance, oh God. Let your presence be with her always. Lord, this moment we also uh, remember all our members, Lord, uh, who require the so fast recovery, especially we remember Nelson also. You touch him and heal him so that he may recover soon and may bless your name, Lord. This moment, as we all gathered here to study your word and to meditate on your word and to discuss upon it, Lord, I pray that uh, your spirit leading may be given to us so that our hearts and minds may be open and we may be able to see the truth and uh, may be able to experience more intimately, O oh God. The discussions we do and the words we speak and the meditations we, we do, Lord, may be acceptable in your sight. Bless the time that we spend together. It may be a time of edification in our lives. Thank you very much for listening, uh, leading, uh, listening to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Praveen. And once again, uh, good evening to all of you. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we are in the third session of the series that we started. Uh, which we have titled Creation Controversies. Uh, these are controversies that people have with regards to the creation account, and especially Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, and then, of course, Genesis as a whole has certain uh, issues that can become controversial. And I, uh, I was thinking maybe we will have one or two more sessions and pick up other controversies from the book of Genesis. But nevertheless, today's topic uh, is what I have titled as, Did God Use Evolution to Create the World? I have, I have uh, titled it slightly differently from what we had earlier thought, uh, because this is how the debate is going on today. And that's why I tried to make it very specific. Did God use Evolution, most of you know the theory of evolution. I'll mention a little bit about that. The evolution to create the world. Even as we begin and, uh, you know, uh, and get into this subject, let me have a quick survey. Uh, now, uh, I'm not sure if how those who are have a blank screen, maybe you can shout, or shout it out. My, uh, a quick survey as to do you believe God used evolution to create the world. You may say yes or no. All right. Let me get uh, a sampling of what you think. Do you think God used creation to, I mean, to say evolution to create the universe? Any takers? Yes, no. Yes, God used evolution. No, God didn't use evolution. Mr. Yes, Rao no. says no. Okay. <laughs> He is brave enough to go first. He says no. All right. Well, any other takers? No. Vanessa says no. Uh, Bertram says no. Vincent, say, <laughs> Vincent is going against the tide. He says yes. All right. That's very interesting. Any, any yeses or noes? Uh, Pearl says yes. <laughs> okay. That's kind of, Uncle. Not completely. Maybe a little bit. <laughs> All right. Pearl says, uh, all right. She says, uh, okay, God could have used evolution. Any, any, other any other answers? Right. Franklin, for your information, we are just taking a poll. Did God use evolution to create the world? Yes or no? So uh, what would you be your answer? Is it yes or no? I, we can't hear you because <laughs> I'm not sure what you're saying, Franklin. You are on mute. Uh, David says no. Okay. All right. Sachin, I think you have an answer, but you're, you're hesitating. <laughs> what is your answer, Sachin? I'll wait and let it proceed. 
Okay, you'll wait for the presentation. Surya Murthy says no. Okay, so it looks like we have an overwhelming no. Now, uh, Franklin, did you have a yes or a no? One, one, one minute, sir. Uh, sir, uh, sir, uh, my answer is both yes and no, sir. <laughs> we got a yes and no here. That's very interesting. Yes, I'm to on the Maybe same page, Pastor. When I, when I take Okay, Sheila, uh, not Sheila. I think it's Pauline who says. I mean, yes. like, girl, the thing because I'm not too into depth in knowing this. So, okay. <laughs> yes, <laughs> no. Right. Diplomatic, though. <laughs> okay, interesting. Uh, Franklin, okay, we'll, we, I mean, uh, we'll wait for your answer, but yes and no is very interesting. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your response. Let's get into the subject then. Uh, and uh, those of you who said no, uh, wait for some surprises, okay? Because uh, you might. Uh, <laughs> you might find out that uh, you are not in the best company. <laughs> okay, uh, just teasing you on that, but let me uh, just give you a, a quick recap of the previous two uh, sessions that we had. Remember the first one on this creation controversies was basically discussion on how to read Genesis 1. And hopefully we made it clear that Genesis 1 and basically the Bible is not necessarily a science textbook and hence must not be read as a science textbook. Now it may contain science, it may contain scientific fact, but basically the way it is written, especially for the primary audience, we are the secondary audience, but the primary audience uh, would not have read it from a scientific perspective, right? So. We concluded in the first session that Genesis 1 was never intended to give us the how of creation, right? The how of creation. But it did very categor categorically state the who and the why of creation, all right? So there is a difference. So that is how we conclude session one. In, the, in session two, we discussed the young earth and the old earth controversy, all right? Young earthers, as we call them, say that the earth or the universe is only 6,000 to maybe around 10,000 years old. While uh, the old earthers believe that it is billions of years old, maybe even going up to, uh, you know, between 13 and 14 billions, billions of years. And of course, we, in the second session, discussed also various, uh, what do you say, impediments or problems we encounter when Genesis 1 is read literally or literalistically, right? But what was our conclusion? The conclusion was either way, whether it is old or whether it is young, whether it is 6,000 years old or you know, billions of years old, we cannot deny its existence. Science and theology does not deny the existence of the universe, all right? And whatever view you might hold uh, does not challenge your Christianity. In other words, it is not a salvation issue. Yours, yours and my salvation is not dependent on your view of whether the universe is young or old, okay? So that was our second uh, discussion. Let's now today discuss the controversy on evolution. Was uh, evolution basically means that it took a long period of time for the universe to come to being as it is as we see it today? Or was it an instantaneous creation? Or was it a six day creation? Now there is a difference between instantaneous and six day. Since we are talking about evolution, let me just give you just some basic facts on the theory of evolution as it is uh, understood today, as it is being taught, especially in the science uh, classes. Okay, uh, the theory of evolution started when the famous Charles Darwin wrote his book, Origin of Species. That was the, the famous book that he penned and it was released in, on the 24th of November, 1859. So that is a while ago now, right? And what did, what did this book contain through his experimentation and the evidence that he 
observed over long periods of time. He proposed how life developed by the means of natural selection. In other words, when he says natural selection, he, he basically means that there was absolutely no divine element in the creation of the universe. It was all materialistic. It was all naturalistic, all right? So the elements came together naturally. There was this natural selection of various uh, organisms and hence life evolved. That is how he uh, you know, uh, proposes in his book, Origin of Species. So he uh, went on to say, he, or rather he suggested that organisms best adjusted to their environment uh, and were successful in surviving and reproducing. Once again, notice it's a, it's a naturalistic uh, way of trying to explain the origin of life. And his book, The Origin of Species, was considered to be the foundation of evolutionary biology, right? Today, biology, I mean, has tremendous, um, a lot of mention about Charles Darwin. So uh, evolutionary biology now came into existence because of Charles Darwin. Now, the interesting thing is, and I'm not sure if this is mentioned as often as it needs to be, Charles Darwin himself had a problem with his theory. And there were two specific problems that he himself confessed. And this is very interesting. Let me give you the first one. The first one uh, is, let me just quote him from The or Origin of Species. He says about the origin of life, all the organic beings which have ever lived on this earth may be descended from some primordial form, right? In other words, what he's saying is all the evolution took place because there was something in existence he called primordial form. But here is the problem. He was keenly aware that there was no explanation of how such an ancestral entity had first evolved. In other words, he begins from a particular premise of the existence of some kind of primordial soup or some kind of ancient organism from where life evolved. But where did that come from? He had no answer, right? So, and he himself confessed that. Second problem that he confessed is what has been now called as the Cambrian explosion, right? What is this Cambrian explosion? The word Cambrian refers to a period of time. You could say a geological time period, right? And it supposedly happened 540 million years ago, right? So that is some time ago. So the Cambrian period was, is a reference to something that happened 540 million years ago. Now, what, 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 hap what is this Cambrian explosion? This uh, indicates that there was a sudden explosion of life as per fossil records, right? In other words, uh, in the fossil records, they suddenly found a strata, you know, a strata of life forms preserved in rock, where suddenly there was a whole lot of life forms that came together, that came into existence together. Now, according to uh, uh, evolution, it, it should take much longer. So how did this life form suddenly, all of them come together in that particular period of time? Uh, and he goes on to say, uh, if life evolved gradually, he asked in the origin of species, what would account for an explosion of it? How could suddenly, a whole bunch of life forms come into existence, all right? So these are the two problems that Charles Darwin himself confessed, okay? So that is, I'm just giving you a very brief account of the theory of evolution. It has been developed by scientists over a period of time, and they have tried to 
uh, you know, try to reform it and change it to some extent, but uh, they have not answered that first question. Where did the first, you know, existing material from where life evolved come from? They have still not answered that question. Some of them have tried to give an answer to the Cambrian explosion, but there is an interesting book written by a Christian scientist. Now, notice the word Christian scientist. He's a scientist, but he's also a Christian who believes in the Genesis record. Uh, he wrote a book called Darwin's Doubt. Uh, and the name of this uh, Christian scientist is Stephen Meyer. And uh, excellent, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, I mean to say, uh, he explains these things very well. And he takes the theory of evolution apart. Uh, so uh, if you ever you get a chance to hear Stephen Meyer on YouTube, uh, you will be pleasantly surprised with the information that he has to give. Let's get to the evolution by itself. Now, slowly, we are moving into uh, the evolution itself and the biblical perspective. Now, let me ask a question, and I wonder if how you would answer it. Now, we won't have time to stop and ask you the you know, for your answers. But the process of evolution, what is the process of evolution? And could it be true? Could evolution in some form or the other, forget about the period of time, could it be true? And another Christian scientist whom we heard last time, Hugh Ross, Dr. Hugh Ross uh, is I think an astrophysicist, but he's a very dedicated Christian. He says, yes, he says the evolutionary process can actually be true. What, how he explains it is that change takes place with time. And this is observable in nature. Change takes place in time and it is an observable fact in nature. For example, you plant a seed in the, in, in the ground. What happens to it after a few days? Well, it sprouts. What happens to it after a few, probably weeks or even months, in some cases years? It can either grow into a huge plant, it can grow into a huge tree. Has there been change over a period of time? Yes, it's an observable scientific fact. So you could say that is an evolutionary process, right? Uh, Viruses mutate, and I presume it is, uh, it is uh, right for us to talk about viruses because we are in the midst of this pandemic. Give it time, a virus can mutate. Today we, are, we had the alpha vi variant. Now we have the delta variant, and there may be another variant, I'm not sure. But how come viruses mutate? That is something that happens, a, a change that happens in time, all right? And that's an observ observable scientific fact. Humans change with time. Uh, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, or if, uh, I mean, if, uh, if it happens to be me about 60 plus years ago, and if it is Sanjeev Rao 70 plus years ago, he didn't look the same. <laughs> right? He looks different today than what he was 70 years ago. Is that change in time? Is that an evolutionary process? Well, whatever name you give it, but that's a fact. That's a scientific fact. Christians develop with time. We as disciples of Jesus develop with time. We, 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 we understand more. We grow in character. We uh, become more Christ-like. Is that a change in time or change with time? Yes, it is. It's an observable and you could say a scientific fact. Well, sci scientific probably not, but you, know, you can observe that you have changed and you have hopefully be become better as a disciple of Jesus with time. See, so this, all of these thoughts has now kicked off the debate. There are people who believe in an evolutionary process who are dedicated, uh, uh, you know, dedicated disciples of Jesus. And then there is the theory of evolution. 
So, since evolution can be noticed in nature, the question then uh, comes back to us. Could God have used evolution to create the world? Some scientists say that it is consistent with scientific evidence. And they go on to say that it actually harmonizes science and the Bible. And some Christian scientists took this very seriously, have studied the subject, and they have come to believe in the evolutionary process, right? And you will be surprised the number of science, I mean to say Christian scientists and dedicated Christians who believe in this. And for all of those who said, no, I don't believe in evolution or God could never use evolution. Well, uh, <laughs> it'll be interesting for you to notice the names that I'm going to read out. Among the Christian scientists who believe in the evolutionary pro or rather God could have used the evolutionary process are, and I've already mentioned some names, Dr. Hugh Ross, Dr. Stephen Meyer, Dr. Francis Collins, who we will hear in a video uh, towards the end of this uh, session, Dr. Alistair McGrath. Do you remember that name? Dr. Alistair McGrath, who is a scientist and a, a very leading theologian, right? All of these people believe in the evolutionary process or at least do not oppose it, do not say no, uh, right? And I presume they would fall in the camp of what Poppins said, yes and no. <laughs> um, now, who are the Christians who endorse this? Or who, who would say, who are not opposed to the evolutionary process? And once again, you will be a bit surprised as to the names that I'm gonna read out who actually do not oppose the evolutionary process. Tim Keller, Timothy Keller uh, is a pastor in New York and I think he comes on YouTube quite often. N.T. Wright, does that name sound a bell to so many of you? Carl Barth, C.S. Lewis, Billy Graham. All of these people do not say that God could never use evolution. Amazing, isn't it? I was quite surprised when I began to uh, research into this and began to see that these people uh, do not oppose the evolutionary process. Okay, so I'm gonna leave that there at this moment and I'm going to move on to uh, explaining the process, you know, the three creation beliefs that Christians propose three creation accounts that Christians believe in, and then I will move on to the GCI position, all right? Okay, let me get into the three creation accounts that Christians believe in. And the first one is called creationism. Maybe I'll just mention the names. There is creationism, there is intelligent design, and there is theistic evolution, which is also known as evolutionary creationism or evolution within creation. We'll come to that a little later. Creationism is what a number of Christians believe in. What, what, what does it mention and what does it say? Creationism is a term to describe the belief that Genesis, the Genesis 1 account of creation should be understood in strictly literal terms. Creationists typically believe that the seven days or the six days if you leave out the seventh day, which was a Sabbath rest, the, seven, the six days in Genesis 1 are literally 24 hours in length. So they are basically the young earthers or the young earth creation uh, you know, uh, account believers. So this is what creationism is. And I'm presuming that some of you may probably fall in that particular camp. Secondly, Christians who believe in intelligent design. Actually, intelligent design was coined by scientists, not necessarily Christian. But there are a number of Christian uh, scientists who have come to accept the intelligent design 
uh, 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 proposition. Okay, and one among them is Stephen Meyer, who uh, who I mentioned a while ago. Now, what do intelligent design or ID proponents believe? ID is not in your uh, you know uh, your uh, your proof of identity. <laughs> it mean it stands for intelligent design. Proponents of ID accept the findings of science, but argue that evolution cannot explain certain features in the development of life. These unexplained features or gaps, you remember we had discussed the gap theory sometime back. Uh, gaps are evidence of an intelligent designer, they claim. Intelligent design does not explicitly align itself with Christianity. The very fact they use the word intelligent design, they say, is some, some force. They could have attributed to a force, they can attribute it to a god or gods, or they can attribute it to a personal god, all right? But it is something outside of the material that brought the creation into account by the use of the mind, which basically means intelligent design. Uh, it claims that the existence of an intelligent cause of the universe and of the development of life is a testable scientific hypothesis. So intelligent design proponents basically believe that it's a testable scientific hypothesis that evolution as proposed by Darwin and the other scientists, evolutionary scientists, cannot explain certain things, that it needed an intelligent input for creation to actually take place in the way we see it today. Now, a person like Stephen Meyer, who is a Christian also, say that intelligent design is basically God. Now, because he believes in the Christian God, but some scientists may not necessarily believe in the Christian God. They may say it's some force, right? And some people could even attribute it to an alien force but there has to be intelligent input. Only then creation can happen the way we see it today. Let me go to the third one now. It is called theistic evolution. It's also called evolutionary creationism. There are two other names for it. Cre uh, evolution within creation or God-guided evolution, right? See, the, these are the various names that basically believes uh, uh, that God could may have used evolution or the process of evolution to bring the universe into existence, right? So for them, it is not a contradiction in terms, right? So let me just read uh, some, some thoughts that I wrote down. Theistic evolutionists accept the findings of science and see no contradiction between the theory of evolution and a proper understanding of the biblical account in Genesis 1. Right. Uh, but of course, the question is, some people may say there is a contradiction. What is a contradiction? Evolution claims that species have evolved over hundreds of millions of years. Doesn't this contradict what the Bible says? that God directly created each and every life form. For this question, the answer that theistic evolutionists uh, say the following. The Bible only tells us that God is creator. It says nothing about how he created. So that is what they say uh, with regards to the objection that some people might bring. So they go on to say, Evolution is the best scientific explanation we currently have for the diversity and similarities of all life on Earth. Evolutionary uh, creationists accept evolution as the best scientific explanation we have for how life on Earth has changed over time. Remember, changed over time, not began. How did life begin? They say God is the creator. But how did it change and come to have various life forms? Then they fall back to the evolutionary process. 
All right. Uh, let me just uh, also mention that some of these creation creationists or, or, or what do you say, theistic creationists also say that a vast universe came into being through the Big Bang. All right. Now, some of you may not accept the Big Bang theory, but the Big Bang theory is how the you know, scientists uh, seem to explain uh, the beginning of the universe, right? For example, they say, uh, a, a person like Dr. Hugh Ross, who is also a Christian, says that the Big Bang is actually mentioned in scripture. How does he prove that? He goes to Psalm 102, uh, sorry, Psalm 104 and verse 2. He uses this particular verse to say that God create the uni created the universe through the Big Bang. What does Psalm 104.2 says? It says the following. The Lord wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent. Notice those words. He stretches out the heavens like a tent. And to this, a person like Dr. Hugh Ross says, this is a reference to the fact that this stretching out is the Big Bang. It began as an explosion, but it stretched out. The universe stretched out. And scientific evidence says that today, the universe is still expanding. So in one sense, it is still stretching out, right? And someday this universe, as we know it, has to, you know, stop and then it will collapse. All right. So that is what the scientists say. <laughs> but a Christian scientist would say that this is evidence of the Big Bang. Now, some objections that some people might bring, uh, you know, to say, oh, you know, God could never use millions of years or billions of years to create. Why do they say that? Well, God is a God of miracles. Everything God creates should happen instantaneously. True or false? Yes or no? Should everything that God create, should it happen instantaneously? Well, if you say yes to that, then you are going against the Genesis 1 account. Because how many days did God take to create the universe? Six days. <laughs> six days. Why did he take six days? Why couldn't he have taken only one day, 24 hours? Or for that matter, why couldn't he have just instantaneously done? All right, so that's a question. And that's a valid scientific question, right? Why six days? If he can take six days, then why, why not millions of years? Why not billions of years? So we Christians must have a valid answer to these questions so you cannot you cannot say that god may not cannot take billions of years then the question is why did he take six days you know 144 hours if you multiply i hope i'm right 24 into uh, you know six days 24 hours into six days for each day right why did he take so many hours so that's a question that uh, you know that that particular argument begs that question so <laughs> Have I left you confused? Well, uh, let me come now to the GCI position. What do we believe? What would, would, he, would we like to believe in our church? And officially, what is it that we say? For that, I'd like to share my screen and read you uh, just a few thoughts that I've penned down. Some of it I've taken from our, web, from our GCI website. Okay, I'm going to share a Word document. Okay. I'm presuming you can see this, right? GCI position. Okay, let's just, I just got three points there. Uh, the second one is a little longer, but let me read from the first one. GCI's view is that good theology. Uh, and, excuse uh, me, Pastor, would you please uh, zoom, it, uh, zoom in a little? Zoom in a little, okay. Uh, uh, how do I do that, uh, Praveen? Right, but oh, no, there is a... Uh, Ah, okay, okay, yes, yes. Uh, let me just see. Uh, is that is that okay? Yes, this is better. Is that better? A little more would be even more useful. 
Okay, uh, I, I won't be able to read it otherwise. Okay, let me just see if I can do it a little bit more. Is that all right? This is fine. Okay, here is GCI's position. GCI views, a view is that good theology and good science harmonize. Whereas science appropriately investigates the natural world, life's ultimate origin falls in the realm of theology. That is one basic foundational categorical statement we will make. What we are saying is science is a valid, uh, what you say, discipline to investigate the natural world. We are not against science, but science cannot answer the question of the ultimate origin, only theology can. So that is the first point that we take as GCI. Let me go to the second point. Uh, second point begins to read the following. We believe that God gave the scientific record for human instruction and knowledge, and that there is no conflict between the Bible and science. We believe that when the Bible and scientific discovery appear to conflict, that one or the other has been misunderstood. Therefore, we do not deny the evidence from science that indicates a long history of life on this planet, nor do we deny that God could have created an evolutionary process for the development of species, all right? Uh, we believe that only God can create life and that the Bible does not reveal exactly how he has done this. Therefore, if evolution is true, we believe God is the author of it. I'd like you to notice something very important there. What we are saying is, God is the originator of life. He's the creator of the universe. There are no doubts about it. Now, could he have used evolution? Maybe, maybe not, right? Uh, is it possible for him to use evolution? Certainly. And does the scientific record say uh, uh, there, is, there has been an evolutionary process? Uh, scientific record says yes, and we are not against it. But we are not categorically saying that evolution was the only way God could have used to create the world. Okay, so that's very important. Let me go to the third point. And there are two important, I, I call it flaws, right? Flawed conclusion. And this is it. First one, accepting evolution means you can't believe in God is a false conclusion. Secondly, accepting God means you can't accept evolution is also false. I hope you understood what I'm trying to say there. You see, uh, what, I'm, what I basically mean is that if you believe in God, that does not necessarily have to mean that you have to disbelieve in evolution, right? It does not necessarily have to mean that you have to disbelieve in the process of evolution, right? Uh, our if, if you accept evolu the evolutionary process, that does not mean you're against God. Okay, I hope I made that clear. All right, I'm going to stop sh my share there and come back to the main uh, screen here. Okay, so what are we saying then? What is the GCI position? Basically, what we are saying is, you know, we don't know exactly the how of creation. How God created is not revealed for us. In the Bible, God has given us a scientific, uh, or I should say the, pro, uh, the, the faculty of reasoning, the faculty of mind that can experiment, that can find uh, evidences for certain things. And maybe it is science that can tell us a little bit more about the universe. For example, science has brought a categorical conclusion that the universe had a beginning. That's a scientific fact, and that's also a biblical fact. Secondly, science has also proved that our earth, the creation had to be fine-tuned so that, I'm using the word, a scientific word, fine-tuned, so that life could exist on the earth. That's a scientific fact. And I would say, that's a biblical fact too. I mean, from the Bible, you can find out ways to understand that. All right. Now, I, I remember Mr. Rao had shared a, a video with me with uh, somebody speaking about evolution. 
And he made this statement, this particular theologian made this statement that science has nothing to say about creation. He says, science has nothing to say about creation. Only God has something to say about creation. And I believe it's absolutely false because science says, science says the universe had a beginning. Science says the universe is fine tuned for the existence of life. So science does have something to say about creation. So I don't believe in that, theolo in that theologian's conclusions, unfortunately. Right? And that is the unfortunate thing, you know, and sometimes we, uh, as Christians, make some conclusions which is unnecessary. Uh, and, and we pit science against the Bible, which I, th I don't think we should do. I'm going to end my presentation now uh, by giving you one more last thought. Why is it that we say that we don't know? Many times you probably heard, uh, we don't, uh, uh, we categorically say that there are some things we cannot know from the scriptures. All right. For example, uh, as far as this is concerned, we don't know how God created the, the universe. We know who created it and why he created it, but we cannot categorically state how he created it. All right. Uh, we don't have the scientific, you know, record of it in the scriptures. Why is it that we always come to this conclusion? We don't know. Some of you might be a bit tired of it. You must be saying all the time you are just, you know, falling back on you don't know, you don't know. Well, I think there is a good reason for us to say don't know. And I'm going to give you three very quickly. All right. First, the most obvious, there is just not enough evidence. When you do not have enough evidence, it is better to say you don't know rather than make some wild speculation. Okay, that's one point number one. Point number two, our mistakes in the past. We as a fellowship from years gone by have made some very categorical statements which today is not correct. We have come to see is not correct. We have made scientific statements which were not correct. We have made prophetic statements which were not correct. We have made doctrinal statements which were not correct. And today we are beginning to realize that uh, we had to reform. And you know, when you go and make categorical statements, people can actually call you a false prophet. And I'm very sad, saddened when I hear some people calling Herbert Armstrong a false prophet. You know, unfortunately, that is, uh, you can't deny it. Because Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 22 says the following. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 22 says the following. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or prove true, that is a word which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. The Bible says, do not speak presumptuously. Do not say that the Lord has said. And how many times I've heard people say, God told me. Now, I understand that you know, some people say, yeah, God told me, which, which you know, we basically understand that there is a conviction that you have. But uh, when, when people say that they have heard some audible voice or you know, God, they, they had a cup of tea with Jesus Christ across the table, Whew, I, I, I don't think uh, I would want to subscribe to any of that stuff, you know? So why do we say we don't know? Because we are afraid of what Deuteronomy 18 says. Deuteronomy chapter 18 says, don't speak presumptuously in the name of the Lord. And finally, the third point. Very clearly, the Bible establishes limits to our understanding. You know, you and I cannot outsmart God by human wisdom, right? And the book of Job categorically proves that, right? Uh, Job, when Job asked God, you know, his, his questions, uh, and I'm not going to go into those, but I will just give you some statements that God makes to Job. And I think it's very relevant for our discussion today. God's dialogue with Job in uh, Job 38 and verse 4. This is what Job's, uh, this is what God tells Job. 
where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understand. Can any one of you tell? But there are Christians who come and say, oh, I know. <laughs> I know how God laid the foundations of the earth. That's presumptuous. But God himself is saying, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. He's telling Job, Job, you don't have the knowledge to instruct me. I haven't given you that knowledge. One more thought, right? Uh, or basically, that basically says that there are God-established limits to our understanding. And what does Job say? Uh, there are a few more if you read uh, the verse chapter 38 and 39. It's fantastic how, how God confronts Job. I don't, I don't have the time to go into that. Uh, Job, how does he conclude? Notice in Job chapter 40 and verse 4. I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I lay my hand on my mouth. What is Job saying? I don't know. I don't know. One more thought. And this is Job 42 verse 3. I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful to me, which I did not know. Which I did not know. Job is saying I should not have uttered what I don't know. Brethren, let us be careful when we try to speak in the name of the Lord or speak on the authority of the Bible. Let us be very careful how we say it. That's the reason why we say sometimes it's better to say I don't know rather than make statements presumptuously. Okay, I'm going to stop there. I'm sorry I've taken so much time. Uh, let me quickly ask uh, Praveen to share the video. This video is by... Dr. Francis Collins, and you remember I mentioned his name earlier. He's the director of the National Institute of Health. He is a Christian and he's a scientist. Actually, Dr. Francis Collins is the boss of Dr. Fauci. Have you heard of Dr. Fauci? <laughs> uh, he's the one who, uh, uh, you know, is running this pandemic issues here in the U.S. Uh, a very interesting thoughts that he brings up with regards to science and the Bible. And I believe that his statements shows how we in the scriptures can say it's an inclusive situation. Perhaps I can say it's a Trinitarian perspective. Let's roll that tape and then get into our discussion. Science is about trying to get rigorous answers to questions about how nature works. And it's a very important process that's actually quite reliable if carried out correctly with generation of hypotheses and testing of those by accumulation of data and then drawing conclusions that are continually revisited to be sure they're right. So if you want to answer questions about how nature works, how biology works, for instance, science is the way to get there. Scientists believe in that, and they are very troubled by a suggestion that other kinds of approaches can be taken to derive truth about nature. And some, I think, have seen faith as therefore a threat to the scientific method and therefore to be resisted. But faith in its proper perspective is really asking a different set of questions, and that's why I don't think there needs to be a conflict here. Uh, the kinds of questions that faith uh, can help one address are more in the philosophical realm. Why are we all here? Why is there something instead of nothing? Is there a God? Isn't it clear that those aren't scientific questions and that science doesn't have much to say about them? But you either have to say, well, those are inappropriate questions and we can't discuss them, or you have to say we need something besides science uh, to pursue some of the things that humans are curious about. For me, that makes perfect sense. But I think for many scientists, uh, particularly for those who have seen the shrill pronouncements from extreme views that threaten the, what they're doing scientifically and feel, therefore, that they, they can't really uh, include those thoughts uh, into their own uh, worldview, uh, faith can be seen as, uh, as an enemy. And similarly, on the other side, some of my scientific colleagues 
uh, who are of an atheist persuasion are sometimes using science as a club over the head of believers, basically suggesting that anything that can't be reduced to a scientific question isn't important and it just represents a superstition and should be gotten rid of. Part of the problem is I think the the extremists have occupied the stage. Uh, those voices are the ones we hear. I think most people are actually kind of comfortable with the idea that science is a reliable way to learn about nature, but it's not the whole story. And there's a place also for religion, for faith, for theology, for philosophy. Uh, but that harmony perspective doesn't get as much attention. Nobody's as interested in harmony as they are in conflict, I'm afraid. OK. Uh, I'm presuming that, uh, yes, uh, Bertram, go ahead. Just to say that I appreciate uh, what uh, Mr. Franklin Poppin just uh, took the time and effort to tell us. OK. Thank you. Right. Any other thoughts or comments? Yes, sir, but you laid the groundwork, sir. You made the groundwork. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, Ms. Zakara, yeah, for, uh, for, you know, for the difficult subject, you know, having uh, put it across so nicely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anything on the, on the subject itself? I hope you understand. Uh, yes, Sachin, go ahead. Thank you so much for leading us, but like others, I can vouch. We need to hear the recording, do the study, and then perhaps we'll be able to, to, to comment our views. But thank you for leading. Yes, we need to go once. Personally, we need to go again through the message to then connect, and then we'd come back to you for any queries. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, feel free if you have, you know, you can send in your questions or whatever and we can always uh, dialogue. It's very helpful because we all learn from it. Okay. Otherwise, uh, I want to thank you all for once again joining us today. And uh, I hope it was beneficial, especially uh, I, I wanted to bring in the GCI position. And I also wanted you to understand why sometimes we have to say we don't know. It is uh, safer for us to do that. Uh, if you should have any thoughts on that, uh, you know, feel free to, to uh, share it with us. Uh, let's close in prayer. And uh, if I can request Vanessa, would you like to lead us in a closing prayer at this time? Right. Thank you. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together to hear your word, to have faith and trust in you. Help us, guide us in our belief. Show us the way, the truth and the light. We thank you for this evening and the time spent with you. We thank you for giving us knowledge, for guiding us and giving us peace. We thank you. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this night that you are going to put before us. We thank you for the food, the shelter. We thank you for giving us much more than what others have. We ask you once again to guide us through the night. And with your guidance and blessings, keep each and every one of us, each and every one of your children safe. In Lord Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. God bless you all and have a good evening.